All right, welcome to the beginning of Unit 11. Uh, unit 11 is going to be kind of a hodgepodge unit. It, it may seem at times that we are a little all over the place, but that is reflective of the time period that we are going over. It is no coincidence that the name of this unit is the uncertain times of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. We are going to cover everything from societal changes during these decades to political changes to conflicts to the economic side of the United States and everything in between. This unit is going to take us a while to get through. It's about five weeks long. It will carry us all the way through uh, until our week of review before your final. So know that we're going to hang in this unit for quite some time. Let's start with your weekly outline. This week is kind of a light week for you. Uh, we have Journal 29. There are three readings listed for you there. Uh, and your other assignment for the week is Unit 11, Document Set 1. This document set is going to be on the United States post-World War II, the fear. Now, we covered McCarthyism at the end of the last unit and the Red Scare and what... Uh, more government actions were being taken against communists, but I want you to look at the societal half of the Red Scare and what the average American and, and how the politics of the time were influencing the average American. So take a look at those document sets. All of that is due by Friday at 11.59. All right, to start, we have to go from Truman to Eisenhower. Eisenhower, uh, his uh, shortening for the longest last name is Ike. Okay, let's start with Truman. Truman is going to inherit the presidency after the great FDR. You've got to think, FDR was reelected three times. He served a total of three full terms, got into his fourth term, and that is when we saw him die post-World uh, War II, right at the end. Doesn't even get to see the end of the World War that took up a large majority of his presidency. And now Truman has to fill those shoes. And, and we talked about the filling of the shoes and directing us through the uh, end of the war, but we didn't talk about the filling of the shoes in, in regard regards to the societal programs put in place after uh, uh, or with the New Deal. So let's start with uh, after FDR. In 1947, we're going to see the 22nd Amendment get passed. Now this one is very easy to remember. The 22nd Amendment is going to create the two-term limit for the presidency. And no president can serve past two years. Okay, you can only get reelected once. That is it. That is the rule that will forever be the rule unless another amendment gets passed. Uh, and unless we get a Putin-like leader, I don't think that's going to happen. So we, we see the 22nd Amendment be putting into place after FDR because every president before FDR chose not to run again. Okay, so you, you had that two-term limit. With the exception of uh, the other Roosevelt, uh, Teddy tried to run for that third term but was never elected into it. We didn't see anybody else attempt what FDR did, and we want to make sure that no one else, even given the circumstances that FDR was in, attempts to run for uh, anything past two terms. Now, Truman is going to have to fill the shoes of the New Deal, and his goal, his program that he announces in his State of the Union in 1949 is called the Fair Deal. Uh, he was referencing the New Deal policies. Uh, Truman announced these plans for his domestic policy reforms that included national health insurance, public housing, civil rights legislation, and federal aid to education. He also was going to advocate for an increase in the minimum wage, something that we can connect to right now. There is a federal minimum wage that uh, is what the president and Congress will handle. Each state then sets their minimum wage based on the federal minimum wage. I know that's confusing, but the federal minimum wage is exactly that. It's the minimum wage that every state has to follow. Every state can choose to decide uh, to pay more than that, but they cannot set theirs at less. 
So during uh, Truman's presidency, he's going to advocate for an increase in that minimum wage. He'll also look for federal assistance to farmers uh, looking to post-World War II not make the same mistakes as post-World War I. Uh, and he wants to extend Social Security. Uh, and he also urged with the Fair Deal immediate implementation of anti-discrimination policies in employment. Uh, so we're seeing kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, a little bit that we want to follow up to the New Deal in, in ways like Social Security, the assistance to farmers, uh, and then kind of taking uh, some, some risks on his own with a national health insurance. This is a time before Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, this is a time that influences where we're at right now. The, the debate still, should we have and keep a, a national health insurance program? And you can see he strays from the New Deal with the civil rights legislation and these anti-discrimination policies and employment. Now, when we look at how, uh, how we uh, see Truman kind of decline, because all of these sound great, Truman's going to get reelected in a landslide in 1948, and he is going to get Congress to pass many of these reforms that I had just mentioned. Uh, minimum wage is going to go from 40 cents an hour to 75, per 75 cents an hour. Uh, he gets the Housing Act, which gives 800,000 new houses for the poor. Uh, he's going to get to extend Social Security. Uh, the, the only piece that is really rejected is the idea of the national health care. This we will not see get passed until um, until uh, Linda B. Johnson with Medicare and Medicaid. This idea will not get picked back up for some time. Eisenhower's ultimate downfall for the fair deal and for himself is going to be the participation in the Cold War, uh, and in particular, the Korean War. These foreign affairs are going to distract Truman from the domestic issues that he had set out to uh, take care of, uh, and, and that will easily get him uh, to a place where he, he does not go for that next election. Uh, what we do see happening is a new candidate coming to light. Uh, Truman will not choose to run in the election of 1952. Instead, we will have Eisenhower versus Stevenson. And you can see overwhelmingly that map is red uh, in part to uh, the, the demand for change that people will again have in 1952 and the promise of Eisenhower to get us out of uh, Korea. During the election campaign of 1952, Eisenhower is going to be very critical of Truman's fair deal, uh, but he won't go and swing to the extreme of some of the Republican conservatives. Those Republican conservatives will be referenced as the old guard Republicans who talked about eliminating the fair deal and New Deal programs and rolling back a lot of the government regulation on the economy. Sounds familiar right? We've been in this loop before. But Eisenhower is going to favor a more moderate course, and he'll call himself a modern Republican, meaning that he wanted to preserve individual freedom in the market economy, yet ensure that the government would, would provide necessary assistance to workers who had lost their job or were too ill or had aged, who were no were at no fault uh, could and, and could not provide for themselves. So he's kind of down the middle of the road, uh, and and he he does that on purpose. And as president, Eisenhower is going to think that the government should help provide some benefits to the American people. He'll even go so far to sign legislation that expands Social Security. He also looks to increase the minimum wage. And he creates the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in his cabinet. 
He's going to support government construction of low-income housing, uh, but he will favor a little bit less government spending than Truman had. So he really truly is this middle-of-the-road Republican. Instead of swinging to the other side, he swings more to the middle, which at the time I think is what people were really looking for. Not extreme, but more in the middle. Eisenhower getting elected in the election of, the, of 1952 is going to end the Democrats' 20-year reign over the White House, and we will see a change come. Now, Ike as president is, is going to take a, a different approach to the Cold War. Uh, he's going to inherit the policy from Truman of containment, but he had promised to end the Korean War, something that he does successfully do. I mean, the Korean War doesn't end in a victory, but the Korean War ends and we and we are no longer participating, which is ultimately what the people wanted. So he, he keeps true to that uh, political campaign of ending the Korean War. He does that through atomic diplomacy. Remember, he is going to say uh, when we are negotiating between North and South Korea, if we can't come to a place where we agree, well, then I guess we are going to have to use the atomic weaponry that we have. And that works with Korea, but it's not going to be a theory that can be revisited every time there is a Cold War conflict. Now, with that inherited policy of containment, we are going to see John Foster Duels, the Secretary of State for Eisenhower, really take up a, a, a I would say extreme, maybe you can disagree with me on this, uh, policy towards uh, containment. The big fear that John Foster Duels is going to have, and we've heard of him before, I talked about him at the end of the last unit, his big fear is domino theory, which the political cartoon you can see uh, plays well with that. Domino theory is just that. If you've ever played with dominoes and stacked them up and then knocked one over and the whole thing falls, that's the exact theory behind uh, the, the spread of communism here. We believed that if the USSR just just hit one, just got one to turn, no matter where that one place was, uh, that there would be many to follow. And, and we thought that China was just the beginning of that. And, and we're going to get into Korea because of that idea. We'll get into Vietnam because of that idea. And we'll see many different uh many different conflicts because of it. Now, John Foster Duels is going to live in this area of brinkmanship, okay? Brinkmanship. And that this is this is a little bit scary. Uh, he, he is going to believe that we should challenge right to the brink of atomic war with our enemies, threaten with that massive retaliation. And he'll use this when we look in just a second in places like Hungary, in places like Poland. Uh, Duels is going to say, well, we should just threaten uh, the, the uh, technology that we have. Any small skirmish should be met with massive retaliation. Uh, but we, we soon realize that this is not going to work. This threat of massive retaliation doesn't always uh, hold successful because it could result in that idea that we also have already talked about, mutually assured destruction. If we use the atomic weaponry, there are others now that have it and are not afraid to use it. So we have to be very careful with how we use these threats. Uh, Duels is also going to have a close relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency, who at the time was going to be run by his brother, Alan Duels. Uh, and uh, John Foster Duels is going to be the first Secretary of State to be really directly accessible to the media, where he held department press conferences, and it will be a, a different face. Uh, being not not that the Secretary of State hadn't always been very prominent, but will be even more prominent in the eye of the American people. Now we have to look at a little bit of the skirmishes, 
that's a good word for it, that we run into with this combating against communism. Uh, Khrushchev is going to be the prime minister uh, of the USSR between 1958 and 1964, which you should have heard about in uh, your global classes here. Uh, Khrushchev is going to uh, challenge duels this stance on massive retaliation and we're going to see this come with the uh, treatment of Hungary and Poland. There is going to be an uprising in Hungary that is going to be viciously crushed by Soviet tanks, troops, uh, thousands are going to be killed, wounded, nearly a quarter of a million Hungarians will flee the country. Uh, these problems in Hungary are going to begin in October of 1956 when protesters take the streets demanding for a more democratic political system and freedom from Soviet oppression. Uh, in response to those protesters, the Communist Party officials will, uh, will look to dismiss uh, those who are coming out against the, the, uh, the leadership of the Soviets. Uh, and, and this is going to be a time where we're, we're, when Khrushchev takes over that we're trying to push away from the Stalin po Stalinist policies. Um, the Communist Party officials are going to appoint um, a new premier uh, and, and he will criticize openly uh, the ideas of Stalin and ask the Soviets to withdraw their troops from Hungary. The Soviets do so, but when they, but when tried to push the revolt forward, um, it, it will result in a more negative, uh, result. The, uh, the fighting will take to the, st the streets and we will see fighting break out. The Soviet power is going to push back uh, and try to con keep their power in Hungary. Uh, the Hungarian prime minister announced that the invasion is going to be very grim on broadcast and he will declare our troops are fighting the government is in its place uh, but within hours uh, that prime minister is going to seek asylum in Budapest uh, he will be captured and executed uh, and and this uh, leaves his place open uh, to be replaced. Now, the Soviet action is going to stun people, how violent the Soviet reaction was to the people of Hungary asking for more democratic principles. Uh, and Khrushchev, when he takes over in 1958, is going to pledge to retreat uh, and, and not use these Stalinist policies and the repression of the past but he, uh, he doesn't really keep up with those promises as demonstrated by what happens in Hungary. Uh, you're going to see 2,500 Hungarians die. Many leave to seek refuge. Uh, and there will be a following of armed resistance, strikes, mass arrests in the months after, causing a huge economic disruption. Uh, but what this does is it kind of challenges the idea that the United States was going to constantly use massive retaliation when the communists suppressed democratic demands around the world. The United States didn't do anything. Uh, that we, we, we were watching on the sidelines. Uh, John Foster Duels suggested that the United States support the liberation and the captive peoples in communist nat nations. But as the tanks took down the protesters, the United States didn't actually uh, go out to help people. We just gave our sympathies. The same kind of thing is going to happen in Poland. Uh, Poland is going to come out uh, against the Soviet forces uh, and the people will demand uh, demand a more democratic uh, response, democratic electoral process, and they will be put down. Um, and, and, and the United States again does nothing. Uh, 
Another place where we're going to have to uh, kind of put our money where our mouth is is the Suez Canal. Now, we just heard about the Suez Canal in recent times because that big, huge ship just got stuck there. We're going back to when the Suez Canal is being constructed. Uh, there, there are going to be a few characters here. We have the British, we have the French, and we have the Israelis. Uh, the the uh, president for the Israeli forces is going to be uh, President Nasser. Uh, it, Israel is going to uh, uh, pair with the British and the French to come together to build the Suez Canal. But the British and French are going to be clearly very behind schedule. Uh, they, they will turn for, for help uh, to the United States or the Soviet Union. Now, the British and the French troops are going to land at Port Said and Port Fod and, and take control of the area around the Suez Canal. However, they hesitate. Uh, and their hesitation opened the door for the Soviets, who were also putting down the uh, crisis in Hungary at the same time. The Soviets come in and respond. The Soviets are eager to kind of use their, uh, their, their force to gain a foothold in the Middle East and supply arms to Czechoslovakia, uh, to, from Czechoslovakia to the Egyptian government, um, and eventually helped Egypt construct a, a dam on the Nile River after the United States had refused the project. Uh, Khrushchev is going to uh, threaten to rain down nuclear missiles on the Western on Western Europe if the Israeli, French, British forces did not withdraw. Uh, and, and this is going to create a ripple between the, uh, the allied relationships because Eisenhower has to really measure his response here. He's going to warn that the Soviets should not recklessly talk about nuclear conflict because that's only going to make matters worse. Uh, and he doesn't he doesn't want Khrushchev or the United States to directly intervene in this this uh, slow down this conflict that that people are are executing to fight over the land for the Suez Canal. However, uh, Eisenhower is just going to issue some stern warnings to the British, French, French, and Israelis to give up their campaign and withdraw from the Egyptian soil. Uh, Eisenhower's upset with the British in particular because they did not keep the United States informed about their intentions. Instead, uh, they just kind of tried to uh, do this all on their own, provoking the Soviets. Uh, the United States threatened all three nations with economic sanctions if they persisted in their fighting. The threats do not work. Uh, the British and the French are going to withdraw by December. Israel finally bowed to the U.S. pressure in March of 1957, relinquishing all control over the canal to Egypt. And that is how Egypt gains control of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal marks the first use of of the United Nations peacekeeping forces. Uh, the United Nations Emergency Force was the armed group that was dispatched to the area to supervise the end of these hostilities uh, and push out the three occupying forces. After this Suez crisis, uh, the British and the French who were once really large influential empires were witnessed as being weakening powers and that the United States and the Soviet Union are going to be taking their seats uh, and, and becoming the more powerhouses that we know. Uh, the crisis is going to make Nasser a powerful hero in the growing Arab and Egyptian nationalist forces. Israel, while it didn't gain the right to utilize the canal, was once again granted rights to ship goods along the Straits of Tehran. Uh, Ten years later, Egypt shut down the canal following a six-day war in 1967. Uh, for almost a decade, the Suez Canal became a front line between the Israeli and Egyptian armies. 
1975, uh, the Egyptian president Anwar al-Sadat reopened the Suez Canal and we see how big of an influence it is today because we have about 300 million tons of goods passing through the canal each year. Now, also to add to the combating of communism, we are going to see uh, Eisenhower make a uh, declaration to a joint session of Congress to call for a new and more proactive American policy uh, in the Middle East known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. Uh, this proposal, Eisenhower doesn't ask for specific amounts of funds, but he indicates that he would eventually seek over $200 million in economic and military aid uh, in the years to follow uh, to push out the power-hungry communists from the Middle East. Uh, <coughs> we're going to see the Eisenhower Doctrine be really utilized uh, in the strife in Lebanon in the summer of 1958, uh, where American assistance is requested. Uh, nearly 15,000 U.S. troops are going to be sent to put down the communist disturbance. The Eisenhower Doctrine... Uh, is going to demonstrate our increasing interest in the Middle East. Also, Eisenhower is going to utilize the Central Intelligence Agency to put down communism. Uh, the CIA is created in 1947, and like I said, it's going to be run uh, by uh, John Foster Duell's brother. Eisenhower is going to use the CIA for covert operations to protect American interests. Uh, and, a, and a few ways the CIA works is by installing new governments in Iran and Guatemala with anti-communist rulers. While, while this sounds great that we're stopping the spread of communism, we're putting anti-communist rulers in place, what it does in reality is create a resentment towards the United States because we are picking and choosing rulers for other places. All right. The second section, the last section that we're going to do together uh, today over our lecture is the post-war society. Post-war that I'm talking about is post-World War II. So let's take a look. We have to figure out a transition from war to peace. The goal here is to not run into the worldwide depression that we saw after World War I. Truman is going to be elected in 1948, uh, and then we just said that uh, Eisenhower takes over in 1952, so we're kind of going backwards a little bit to catch up to where we need to be. But the, the GI Bill is going to be put into place post-World War II to avoid the problems that we saw uh, after World War I. The GI Bill is also known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. Uh, and it is put into place to help veterans uh, transition to a post-war life. Uh, the GI Bill creates hospitals, uh, low interest rate mortgages. It's going to grant uh, stipends for tuition. Uh, it's going to uh, help veterans attend colleges or trade schools. From 1944 to 1949, nearly 9 million veterans are going to receive close to $4 billion from the Bill's Unemployment Compensation Program as well. The education and training provisions existed until 1956. And the Veterans Administration offered insured loans until 1962. The uh, Readjustment Benefits Act of 1966 is going to extend all of these benefits to all veterans of the armed forces, including those that served during peacetime. This is going to have a huge impact because think about it, after World War I, when these, these men came back, men, women came back from serving, 
they didn't have anything to come home to. The GI Bill opens it up so that now they do have something to come home to. The, the years that we took away where they may have gone to college, started a business, started a family, we're attempting to give it back. By, by opening up the ability for them to go to school, buy a house, get a little bit of security. We're also avoiding another situation that we saw with the bonus marchers. We're not just promising a check later on to be claimed uh, someday. We're giving actual benefits. This is going to lead to the baby boom. The baby boom is going to uh, see a time where People are not putting off marriages, putting off raising a family. We're really moving out of that depression mindset where we are seeing families getting comfortable to go back to the way things were. And the baby boom is going to be that uh, significant increase in growth of families, which has a, has a large impact on education. This is just common sense. If we have more kids, we need more schools, right? And during this time, schools are going to be very focused on math and science education. So you're going to see education kind of grow at this time. Also, the GI Bill is going to have a large effect on the suburbs. This is the time in the, in the late 1940s, beginning of the 1950s, where we see uh, suburban America grow. People want to move out of the cities uh, into the suburbs. They want to commute into the city. And, and there is going to be a, a demand for housing because the GI Bill gives those low interest loans for people to buy homes. And we have this massive amount of veterans claiming those loans. The suburbs will build up. And one of the most famous figures of the suburbs is William J. Levitt. He is responsible for the building of Levittown. Uh, Levittown is in Long Island, New York, and is widely recognized as the first modern American suburb. It had swimming pools, shopping centers, large backyards. These are going to be the homes with the white picket fences that everybody recognizes. Um, all of the houses are built exactly the same in Levittown. This is like Ford with the car. We are mass producing housing. Uh, all of the houses are going to be the same, the floor pan plans, all of it, so that we could uh, use kind of assembly line style to building houses. The effect that the suburbs are going to have is that they're going to cause a deterioration of the cities because when people move out of the cities, out of the, uh, out of the rural areas into the suburbs, they take their tax money with them, okay? This is also going to lead to the construction of highways, which we'll talk a little bit more later on about. But this connection between the suburbs and the cities, uh, we needed to build, construct all of the highways that we still use today. The economy is going to have a huge shift between 1945 uh, and 1960. Uh, some of the reasons that we see this shift is income is going to increase, which leads business businesses to grow. Remember, people are going to have more money. The average annual income uh, per person doubles. And what that does is it has a, an effect on business needing to grow because people have more money to spend. Uh, so businesses are going to grow uh, during this time period. Large firms are going to start to dominate the industry. Uh, the, we're going to see large firms like General Electric, General Motors, Ford growing to dominate their respective industries because of this spending. We see the conglomerate come out, franchises come out during this time. A conglomerate is a corporation that is made up of three or more unrelated businesses. Uh, and, and what they, these three, this combination of businesses is for is to better combat bad economies. If you have three or more unrelated businesses coming together under one name, if one of them fails or if one of those industries is hit hard, well, then the other ones will just pick up the slack. It makes sense. 
uh, during the depression, businesses learned not to invest in just one single industry. Instead, we should uh, grow. Uh, franchises are going to flourish all over the United States. Fast food, service marts, McDonald's, uh, really tailored to the car as well. Consumerism is going to return to a lot of what we saw in the 1920s. Large-scale buying on credit. Credit cards are going to be on the rise. Supermarkets are going to pop up in the suburbs, giving a whole new way to buy. And, of course, advertising is going to be huge. I always think of the show Mad Men because that is this time. How do we relate to the customer and get them to buy what they may not need but keep up with that idea of the joneses we all need to have this we all have to have it to to be that perfect family which we're going to talk about later in class this week the workforce changes during this time uh, until now, a lot of Americans had made a living as a blue class or a blue collar worker, uh, producing goods, performing services, a lot dependent on manual labor. Uh, but the influence of machines is going to change production and, and machines are going to take a lot of these jobs. So now we see a whole new class of worker coming about the white collar uh, worker. White collar jobs are often in office buildings and they're going to come to outnumber blue collar jobs. These conditions in the white collar jobs are safer than the factory force, uh, but the work can often be very tedious. Um, the blue collar sector is going to work to improve working conditions and wages. In 1955, 33% of the total labor force will be unionized, which sounds like a small number, but it is actually very large. This is the time where we see the American Federation of Labor and the Congress for Industrial Organizations merge together to form the most powerful labor union of, ever, of all. Okay, we see the two biggest labor unions coming together. Because of this merger, we see the government being a little bit intimidated by uh, labor unions and the Taft-Hartley Act will be passed by President Truman. This is going to be a law that restricts the power of unions uh, to, to not see them kind of override the, uh, government's, uh, the, the governmental power. Uh, the, the service sector is going to come out uh, fitting into those white collar jobs. The information industry is also going to form. These two types of work are going to be very impersonal. Uh, they often have little connection to their company's products and, and often felt the pressure to, to dress, to think, to act alike. Uh, think of these people as computers before computers. In the service sector, you see the healthcare industry, uh, retail, banking, insurance industries coming out. Uh, the information industry, think of tele uh, telephone operators, include those that build and operate the first computer. Uh, the, the picture up at the top is a uh, telephone operating uh, work, connecting the lines. It's not just the click of a button of a computer. Somebody actually has to, does that, have to do that for you. Uh, multinational corporations are going to come out during this time as, as well. Companies that produced and sold their goods all around the world. So we're seeing this expansion of our economy rather than the shrinking that we saw after World War I, where the world went into a worldwide depression post-World War I. We're not going to see that happening in the same way post-World War II, which, which highly influences the way our businesses work. Uh, we're also going to see technology develop at this time. When we look at technology, uh, the whole goal here was to produce products that saved time and saved money. Okay, that was the goal of what we're looking for. 
uh, one of the biggest pieces of technology that comes out that's going to be highly influential on the American uh, society is going to be the television. The television is bought at a higher rate than the radio and the car had ever been. Uh, shows during the 1950 create a national culture. Everybody could watch these shows. Everybody, a whole family could sit down and watch these shows from one side of the country to the other, reinforcing the same stereotypes, reinforcing the same uh, uh, gender roles, uh, roles within the family as far as children went. These shows are going to create and reinforce the nuclear family, which is what we'll talk about this week in class. Uh, the TVs also affect political campaigns because now we have a place where candidates can show uh, political ads. They can also uh, debate on the TV, something that people hadn't been able to see before. They could have heard it. But it takes it to a whole other level, and we're going to see that in the Nixon versus Kennedy election uh, in 1960. You can see now the people and how they answer the questions, what their face looks like, how they look under pressure, and it changes how people vote. We're also going to see advertising take over in the television. Like I said, think Mad Men, the creation of all these commercials to draw people in, the ad agencies developing uh, to get people to purchase goods. Uh, so the television uh, connects us with a national culture, but it also uh, kind of changes the minds of the people. The computer, uh, we are going to see uh, transistors invested to be used in computers and radios develop. Over 2,000 are going to be distributed by 1960, and we'll see the beginning of the development of Silicon Valley come about during these times. Uh, the computer, as you can see pictured, used to take up the entire room, one entire room with a computer. Uh, Silicon Valley is where a lot of our, our apps come out of today, a real hub for technology. We're also going to see the harnessing of nuclear power come about after the uh, bomb was used. Scientists realized that you could take and control nuclear fission and, and that could produce heat, generate steam, and could be used for electricity. Not a great thing. Uh, we're going to figure that out as we get into the 1960s. Very dangerous uh, nuclear power. Not real great uh, environmentally as far as effects on people. But we try it. We give it a go. Medicine is also going to be developed during this time. Or more further developed. Uh, we'll see the polio vaccine coming about because of Dr. Jonas Silk's uh, and we'll also see a lot of new surgical techniques come out of World War II, a lot of operating going on in the battlefield that gets back perfected and used uh, on the home front. But to go back to the polio vaccine, before the vaccine uh, for a disease that had crippled FDR, polio had killed and disabled more than 20,000 children in the U.S. every year. But after that vaccine, it's virtually eliminated. We don't talk about polio today because of the vaccine, something that can, can connect to times today where we're trying to get a vaccine developed and into people uh, to uh, hopefully bring down the effects of COVID. Now, t this week in class, we'll talk about the changing culture of the 1950s, a real transitional time for the United States. Don't forget about your assignments this week, Journal 29, Unit 11, Document Set 1. Any questions you have for me, let me know.